Today we're going to have a um, sort of fireside chat. What I mean is, it's a sort of a friend-to-friend -friend talk. Something that we just sit down together with and discuss about ourselves, where we're going, who we are, what is expected of us, and what we have a right to expect. Over the years, we work with individuals, and from time to time we startle them when we say, well, I could help you, but what's the point of that? Suppose I do help you over this condition. Where does that leave you tomorrow? Yes, we can give you the help, we certainly can make the effort, but the real purpose of the teaching is not to get rid of your temporary lacks and limitations, we wouldn't want to bring God down to such a minimal level in our life. The real purpose of this is to release you to freedom. Self-complete in your own Christhood. So that you walk on the water without help. And if at times you need the help, fine. But basically, it is you who are going to walk into paradise no one is going to do it for you. Now, you may have noticed during the last two or three weeks that we have come to a new landmark. And that landmark is that you can take all of your problems one by one, add them up, put them in a great big basket and see that there is only one solution for them. And if today, for example, you are still looking for solutions to problems, you have not observed this new landmark. The solution to every problem is always the same. And we're not talking about temporary solutions. We're not talking about momentary first aid kits. We're talking about a permanent solution. And so you came to the place where you were told in at least 500 different ways, through tapes, through Bibles, through conversation, through talks, through your own med inner meditations, that the solution to every human problem is always I Christ. This should be basic consciousness. That means you're not looking for solutions. You're trying to live in I Christ, which is totally different. It's not the human way of solving problems. It's going in a different direction. And so I want to be sure today that everyone who is studying spiritual truth in this class knows that unless you have self-identified as I Christ, the living child of God, his spirit, his life, his life, unless that is your acceptance, you're going to be left behind watching the others as they rise in consciousness. And you're going to be fighting problems that exist only in your limited human mind. Now let's presume then that we have all accepted I Christ to be the only identity we can ever be. The balance of the teaching then is to show you the nature of I Christ. It isn't any more to help you through your human problems. That is a side issue, an added thing. It is not the purpose of the class, and it should not be the purpose of your study. 
It's simply incidental to the study. It happens automatically when you are in the proper identification. Now then, who is this I, Christ, and how do you stand in it as self? This remains our major responsibility, spiritual integrity to my own identity. Get thee behind me, Satan, then, is that of this world which comes to you to force itself upon you, to make you wrestle with it, to make you accept it as a reality, to make you reach for something to defend yourself against this that comes to you disguised as evil problem, discord, lack, limitation, crisis, emergency, age, bad health, all of these things that the tempter places in your consciousness, these are there for a single purpose, to make you see that there's only one way to meet them. I, Christ, have nothing to overcome. When you have reached the point there you, where you have nothing to overcome, you will have accepted your identity. While you are trying to overcome, you are denying it. What does Christ defend against? Nothing, not even crucifixion. You see then, the goal is to reach the consciousness which says, there is nothing in this world which I must overcome. For only in that consciousness are you Christ conscious. The moment you're overcoming something, you have stepped into another identity other than the Christ. You are in that identity which is not perfect and therefore is not Christ. You have accepted what you are not and you now become a mortal shadow, jostling with those things which are placed there by the tempter who has won the battle, who has convinced you that you are not I Christ. Now, there's been much talk about the tempter, the devil, Satan. It's been personalized as everything from a pitchfork and a man with big ears to mortal mind, world thought, suggestion, influences in the mind, and it's symbolized, of course, in the tree of good and evil in the Bible, which sees a divided world of good here and evil there. And we've spoken it in this class as many other things, such as cosmic television. But always, and this is the point, always the devil, Satan, world mind, carnal mind, suggestion, auto-suggestion, cosmic television, imagery, appearances, mesmeric influences, hypnotic ideas, all this is one and the same nothingness to Christ. Oh, it's so much to human beings. But to Christ, there is no mortal dream. To Christ there is one creator, God the Father. To Christ there is one Son, I the Christ. To Christ I and that creator are one, and that creator being perfect, I am perfect as my Father which art in heaven. And so we are being tested in our spiritual integrity to I Christ.
Everything up to this moment can be considered your 40 days in the wilderness. You have studied. You have labored. You have said the words. You have meditated and contemplated. Now, will you walk in the kingdom of God or will you walk in the world? Schizophrenia is a cosmic ailment. It is the world mind projecting to us a second selfhood so that each of us walks in that which we call my body. But Christ doesn't walk in a physical form and Christ isn't guided by a human mind. And if God be your father and you would be perfect as your father, you cannot walk in a human body or in a human mind and still call yourself I Christ. That means somewhere you must surrender ideas that have lived with you from the moment of birth and before. You cannot be I Christ and Joe Smith who goes to college or Harry Jones who owns the bakery shop down the street. There isn't two of you. There's one, the child of God. And through cosmic schizophrenia, there's another you appearing, which you have called you. And that you is a perfect target for the tempter. To that you, the tempter brings everything that is not of God. And that you, in the past, has always said, look what I've got. Look at my problem. Look where I am. Look at me, I'm a failure. Look at me, I'm getting old. And that you is the tempter itself, the world mind appearing as you. The disguise of the world mind is fantastic. It comes in you, at you even disguised as good things, giving you a temporary taste of success. And then while you live in the false luxury of that temporary success, you discover it's only a success in the you that is not I, Christ, and once more your castle crumbles. Even while you are willing to accept I, Christ, the human mind is putting up a fight. It's going to do this with a minimal amount of effort. It's going to do no more than it must. And the reason is, is that it will never want to willingly surrender its own ego. The ego of the human mind refuses to submit to the authority even of I, Christ, which is your own self. It will find every excuse in the books. And therefore, if you're to succeed in the realization of I, Christ, if you're to walk here in the kingdom of God, if you're to know the meaning of freedom as a way of life, you must transcend the disguises of the human mind so that you can rise above that which is called temptation so that you can rest in one consciousness which leads you not into temptation not into the belief that you are not I Christ but rather leads you into the kingdom of God and so one consciousness one divine transcendental consciousness is always where you should be living. Now when you're across the desk section of the chapter under consideration, Joel has this to say. To you now it must be clear that the infinite way reveals, one, there is a transcendental consciousness it is here and now available to man, which, when attained, 
results in the dying daily of the old man and the rebirth of the new man <coughs> the son of God the son of God then by Christ only comes into your realization when you have accepted it as your identity and you are willing to die daily to a human consciousness to live in a transcendental consciousness one that can look at the sense images of the world without being tempted to accept them as creations of God This transcendental or spiritual consciousness is the power of grace. Freeing man from the law, meaning karmic law, and establishing his life under grace. Now, the second is, there are principles of life whereby this higher consciousness is attained. And the third, that through spiritual discernment, which is now possible, the nature of God as individual consciousness is revealed. The kingdom of God and the secret of spiritual power. Now, everything that this chapter tells you about temptation is not going to make sense to a human mind. But there is one thing that we must do first. And that is this. We were not born of the flesh. Now I'm reading this from the next to the last page in this chapter. We were not born of the flesh. God is our only father. God is our only mother. And that which is called human birth is not creation. Now if this hasn't become to you a meaningful phrase describing the false sense of life that we have entertained, then when you discuss resisting evil or not resisting evil, you'll be looking at it from a human point of view. And you'll be falling into the trap of saying, but we must eat, we must do this, we must do that. Now let's not look at this from a human point of view because what we are learning is not how a human being resist temptation we are learning how I Christ stands in the face of what human beings consider temptation and how I Christ meets these temptations we're not learning what a human being does we're learning what I Christ does because I Christ is our name and that's the importance of this reminder by Joel. And if you still think that God is not your father and your mother, you haven't yet accepted I, Christ. Child of God, perfect as my father. Now let's draw a great big circle around spiritual integrity. It's either that or spiritual adultery. I am either I Christ or I am not. Now let's walk that line for the moment. And we'll look at this chapter from that point of view, that he's teaching us how we can recognize if I'm in I Christ or out of it. Error has its rise in an impersonal source which in the beginning was called eating of the fruit of the tree. Anyone can begin to demonstrate harmony in his experience in proportion to his giving up the temptation to talk about this thing as good and this as evil. And in proportion to his realization that in a God-created universe there can be neither good nor evil, there can be only God spirit.
The belief that there is good and the belief that there is evil is not in I Christ. This takes away about 99% of your human judgment. In one bold sweep, you are told, judge not. What are you judging? The material creation that is not of God. So, I, Christ, will look out and say, who convinceth me of sin? I, Christ, will not say that is an adulteress and that is a thief and that is my betrayer. I, Christ, will say so many surprising things. I, Christ, knows no evil. But I, Christ, also knows no good in this world. And you say, well, that's a vacuum. Don't you see? That's the point of it. It is a vacuum. And it's precisely that vacuum which transcends the human mind. When you have no good, when you have no evil, you are in a vacuum. And you're out of the human mind. And when you're out of the human mind, you discover the divine mind functioning as your mind. When you withdraw good and evil from the objects and persons of this world, you're in the vacuum of no human mind, and that is all that the devil is. The beliefs of the human mind and the human mind that encases these beliefs, that is mortal mind, world mind, human mind, carnal mind, the devil mind. That is all Satan ever meant. The mind which perceives not the kingdom of God is the devil. That's all it was ever intended to convey. That mind which through its incapacity to perceive the kingdom of God where it is here now is literally turning away from that kingdom. And as it turns away, it sees what is not here, the world. And this human mind creates its world. Now suppose you were to take the contents of your purse and empty it out. You would see the various objects Suppose you did the same thing with your mind. Suppose you emptied the contents of your mind to look at it. What would you see? You would see the world that you live in. Because the world that you live in is nothing more than the contents of your mind emptied out. You are looking at the contents of your mind when you look at this world. And you will find that the contents of your mind which sees this world is not seeing the kingdom of God which is here. And that's why it's called the devil. That's why it's called Satan. That's why it's called mortal mind. If it were immortal mind, it would see the kingdom of God that is here. And transcending the mortal mind is resisting the devil resisting temptation now none of us have been that intelligent that we would discover this for ourselves it had to be given from above by seers by prophets by mystics by those who had had the inner experience of reality and then as you learn from them and from your own inner experience that this is the truth you know that the only one who can see the kingdom of God here is your true identity. Only the eyes of I, Christ. The single eye. The soul sense will discern the kingdom of God where the mind sense discerns 
its limited concept called world. So we have nobody to condemn. Each is in the same predicament of being in a human sense of things. We have no one to judge. We have no matter that is good and no matter that is evil. No person that is good and no person that is evil. We simply have the kingdom of God where the devil or carnal mind or human mind sees everything but the kingdom of God. And when we know this is the truth, we learn to walk in the kingdom of God, not with our human mind, but through faith and through inner discernment and basically through the willingness to know that because I Christ is my name, that is where I Christ must be living now, in the kingdom of God. That is where I must be now because I am I Christ. And therefore I Christ accepted means I am no longer in this world. I cannot be in that which is not the creation of God. I must be in the kingdom of God here and now. And therefore the things of the world can only be the dream of a mortality which I am learning to slowly relinquish. The tempter then is going to form you in a sense of mortality, function as your mind, paint objects of matter and conditions of matter, and then force the body it has created to walk in these conditions of matter until the light of I, Christ, dawns in your consciousness. And suddenly you find that the only freedom you can ever have is awakening from the false identity of mortality. And so you measure your progress not by how many problems you overcome, but by the degree to which you know yourself to be the living child of a living God. You are not looking for human solutions. You are resting in identity, watching human problems dissolve back into the world mind that projected them. And you learn this to such a fineness that you can come to the place where you say, I'm not unemployed, but neither am I employed. I'm not sick, but neither am I well. I'm none of these things. I'm not healthy and I'm not unhealthy. I'm not rich and I'm not poor. You never just remove the evil side of that which is this world, but you remove the belief in both sides of the coin of materialism. As long as you believe you're employed, you can be unemployed. As long as you believe you're healthy, you can be sick. As long as you believe you're virtuous, you can be sinful. Both sides of the coin must be removed. There are no opposites in spirit. I, Christ, does not see two sides of a coin, or one. I, Christ, lives in the perfection of spiritual being, knowing nothing else is present. And therefore, I, Christ, is not tempted, not mesmerized, not drawn back into the dream of opposites. I, Christ, never believes that I am a day older today than I was yesterday. In I, Christ, there is no concept called aging. 
It simply isn't there. And these are the remnants of human thought that we learn to drop. I, Christ, is an eternal self. Never born, never dying, always the perfect child of God. And this is an unchanging reality of your being. And because it is a reality of your being, the unreality need never be defended against. Unreality can never be present. It can only appear to be present. Unreality can say you are getting older. But I, Christ, is one with the Father forever. And therefore, we do not fall back into man whose breath is in his nostrils, who thinks in terms of age in a form. We know that my spiritual self is my only self. It is not encased in a form. It is free. It is unconfined. It is not aging, and it is I, Christ. Therefore, I can never aim. Birthdays are fun, but they're not signs of advancing age. And so it becomes very important to us never to lose sight of the fact that what you are as I, Christ, makes it impossible for you to be something else. And whatever something else presents itself is never really there, because only what you are is present, the perfect Christ of God. That means you may have to go through some sufferings and some pains and some problems with the knowledge that these are not mine. They have no rise in me. They do not belong to me. They are appendaging themselves to a false sense of self which the tempter has pressed upon me. They are a state of involuntary servitude. And you step out of this servitude. Get thee behind me, Satan. That is a sign that you have overcome the false sense of mind which is projecting the false belief, the false condition, the false sense of self. When you can say that within yourself, it is an indication that you have overcome the thought of the world which is presenting itself to the doorstep of your true conscience. And you are standing forth as I, Christ, even willing to suffer through being I, Christ, to be persecuted in my name, to be tested in every form of trial that seems necessary at the moment, and yet to stand fast, abiding in the knowledge that your identity is the solution to one or ten problems, whether they come at one time or consecutively. I, Christ, is your solution, and you need no other defense. There can be neither good nor evil, there can only be God, Spirit. I, Christ, is that Spirit. Now God, says Joel, has nothing to fight at any time, no one to fight, nothing to overcome. God is, and God is omnipotence, and beside God there is none else. God has no battles, no enemies, no opponents. But this is true of the Son of God. Christ has no battles, no enemies, no opponents. 
Christ has nothing to fight. Christ has nothing to overcome. The subtlety of nothing to overcome is the secret of the healing consciousness. You remember how Joel pointed out about the wireless, how all the would-be inventors of the wireless were wondering how to overcome the friction of the air, of the atmosphere. And along comes Marconi and beats them to it by knowing there is no friction to be overcome. It's the same in the healing consciousness. And when I say healing consciousness, I mean in the living consciousness. As long as you think there's something to overcome, you're off-center. It's when you can look at that which appears to need overcoming and know that it cannot be there because all that is present is I, Christ. Then you will look at it and know there is nothing to overcome. And that is how you overcome. The secret of healing is knowing there can be nothing to heal because a perfect God cannot create anything needing healing. What can be present but the perfect creation of God? If you want to heal something, you want to heal what is not the perfect creation of God. You have accepted that which God did not create and you want to heal it. That's not being faithful to I, Christ. That's not spiritual integrity. That's human love, human sympathy, human pity. Oh, it sounds heartless, doesn't it? But resist not evil is telling you there is no evil to resist. If it's evil, did God make it? Did God make evil? Therefore, what evil are you resisting? If God did not make it, what is it? It's that little D before the evil. It's the tempter of the human mind making you believe that something exists which God did not create. And then you want to overcome it. But again, in your transcendental consciousness, you will say, what can I overcome? Everything is God made. What God didn't make only appears to be but doesn't exist. Shall I overcome what doesn't exist? The only way I can do that is to know it doesn't exist. Again, that is the Christ or healing consciousness. Joel said it's the hardest thing to do it takes great courage at first, but once you have experienced that in learning there's nothing to overcome, that which you thought had to be overcome is dissolved, then you see the subtlety through which you rise to that level of consciousness where no power is needed. No power is needed. You don't even ask God's help. You can't say, God, help me overcome this evil. Because God would have to say to you, how can I help you overcome what isn't there? I didn't create any evil, who did? It isn't there. Awake from the dream. What is the dream? The dream is that you aren't I, Christ. That's the dream. Don't go chasing solutions. Get back into who you are and watch. Watch, there's nothing to overcome. Nothing. All overcoming is done by the false sense of self. In your true self, you have nothing to overcome. And if you still have things you want to overcome, that's the sign to you you're not in your true self. If you could learn that there's nothing to overcome in this world and not be satisfied until you're in the consciousness which knows that, you would find you're in the Christ consciousness. And you would walk through the world of effects 
consciously knowing you are in the kingdom of God where nothing is to be overcome. Neither war, nor sickness, nor poverty, nor age. For none of it exists in God. In Christ. In reality. first four or five times that you have to face this impending evil and react to it you discover that all your reaction did was to throw coal upon the fire probably the evil caught you unaware by surprise and maybe even at a moment when you thought you were getting along real good in this work. But as you put these little steps together, as you are able not to betray I, Christ, as you are able not to yield to the mental ego which thinks I've got to do something about this God hasn't done it I must as you can overcome that tendency you'll find it is possible to face Circumstances that would normally make you run and scream and hide. It is possible to face them knowing God did not make this which I see. And you won't have to go through all of the thought about it. You will simply be living out of the I, Christ, sense of self, which is not fooled by outer circumstances. For God looks through the eyes of I, Christ, and perceives the universe of God. Are you getting the point then that I, Christ, is your fulcrum? It's the nucleus from which you learn to live. And everything you do, from sunup to sundown, is built around this proper awareness of self and the acceptance of I, Christ, self in your neighbor as well as your own self. So that you populate this universe with one I, Christ. And you remain in spiritual integrity to that universal I, Christ, knowing that all evil is but a suggestion presented by the false world mind to its individualization in you, the human mind. And there you stand fast, abiding in I, Christ, everywhere without opposite. Until this becomes a clear-cut error that has no rise in you or whoever you're working for. Now all of this sounds possible, all of it sounds encouraging, and yet many more steps are required for you to reach the place where you know you're capable of standing in this consciousness. There might be might right now about 13 more points that Joel's going to make, and I think every one of them is a vital link in this consciousness. We do not need God to fight the devil. We need only the word. No, get thee behind me. Now that 
can be misleading to you unless you have caught his point. It isn't saying to this appearance, get thee behind me. It's your capacity to rise above the belief that it is there. When you have risen above the belief that is there, that is the equivalent of saying to it, get thee behind me. Now we've had some critical things happen in our lives. Looking backward for a moment, can you see that you could have looked at these critical things with the knowledge that God did not make them and that you could have faced them with the knowledge that because God did not make them, you do not have to overcome them. They were presented to you as a picture at that moment. And you accepted the picture in most cases and you try to do something about it. Sometimes you failed. Sometimes you succeeded. Many, many times we have failed and we have wondered why. We failed because success was impossible. How could you improve what wasn't there? You could even fool yourself into thinking you improved it, but it boomeranged at a later date. Now then, our spiritual way is to see that just as these emergencies in the past, which we accepted and try to dissolve, change, manipulate, alter, correct, could have been faced by the knowledge that God did not create them, and therefore they only appear to be here, we have learned since then that where they appear to be is not outside of you. They're appearing actually in your consciousness. You think they're outside of you, but that's where they are. They're in your thought. There isn't anything about this world that you know that isn't in your thought. It is your thought you're looking at. You weren't looking at a condition. You were looking at your own thought about what you thought was a condition. Your thought was the tempter. And it was your thought that made you believe you had this terrible condition. And you couldn't get out of that web because all you had to work with was your own thought. And yet that condition, which either terrorized you or made you react in some convulsive way, that condition was your own thought projection. God didn't put it there. Who did? World mind. And functioning in you as that particular picture or condition that you thought was out there. The more you dwell upon it, you'll discover that out there was in your that's how close the tempter is, your thought, because it's human thought. You see why we have said that as long as you dwell in that human mind, you're going to be fooled? It's going to fool you with its great intelligence. All of your problems are in your thought. God did not make them, and further, God didn't make the human mind that entertains the belief in them. Now then, when you overcome your thought, it will be because you have accepted your identity. I, Christ, am incapable of human thought. How can you think humanly and be I, Christ? And therefore, I, Christ, makes you reach the place where you're willing to yield human thought. You won't do this until everything else fails. But when everything else fails, and this is called to your attention, you'll begin to want to do it. 
to yield human thought. We could use fancy words like transcend, but doesn't it mean to yield human thought, to surrender human thought? When you surrender it, you've transcended it. And so, right here where I stand is human thought which wants to tempt me into a continuation of a human life. It wants me to keep within a dying body and a dying mind. Human thought is going to maintain me in a dying body and a dying mind. And the very mind that is going to die is trying to keep me in human thought. The very mind over which I was so elated when the IQ test said this was so high, or this mind is so intelligent, or this is a special mind, that very mind is going to die. Can it be the mind of the Father? Can it be the Christ mind? then why should I live in it? And so right here, I look at my own human thought, and all of the overcoming I ever had to do was not the conditions of the world, but my own human thought. That's where you overcome. To detach from your human thought, to step back, to create your mental vacuum, Everything is leading you to the stillness of the human mind. For when the human mind is still, behold, I come, whose right it is to sit upon the throne. In the stillness of the human mind, you are Christed. Divine thought supersedes all of the finite sense concepts that well up to tempt us in our own human thought. You'll notice in this chapter, Joel mentioned that it may be in this chapter, maybe not, that unless you have a lot of meditations during the day, frequent ones, you're going to be unable to cope with the continuous world thought that is ever encroaching involuntarily into your daily existence. It's a 24-hour thing. And unless you are having frequent meditations in the knowledge of divine self, creating the vacuum of human thought to let the light of divine self express, you'll find that without any volition on your part, you are tempted to live in a world that God did not create. And so in order to have frequent meditations, he suggests shortening your meditations. We all like the luxury of sitting back for 30 or 40 minutes, but often when we do that, we find the first few minutes may or may not be productive and the rest is just a sort of a, a lazy man's habit. We like to stay there because it's pleasant. But we're not alert and alive to Christ always in these long meditations. In fact, we tend to fall into a lethargy. And so Joel has said that if you're not getting the results you want, check it out that way and you'll find that if you'll go to a one and a half minute to three minute silence, that will be all you need. But come back again and again and again. It's the frequency of these one and a half to three minute silences that seems to short circuit world thought. So that every now and then through the day, you're remembering who you are. And then the subtle alchemy of the spirit floats in out of nowhere without rhyme or reason that the human mind can detect and yet there you are feeling the invisible spirit as a living presence, a living intelligence 
moving you, touching you, gently leading you. The guidance is so clear. And it even performs the work. You can take all the credit humanly, but you know that it performs the work. It never performs the work for a human being. That's the catch. It only performs the work for I, Christ. Now, who opposes you in this world? What conditions oppose you and what person? Have we not said that I, Christ, is the universal self? Now what persons do you know then? There aren't any. I, Christ, is the identity where you have found persons. Wasn't I, Christ, the identity of the thief on the cross? even of Judas and of the adulteress. Didn't the master send Judas out to betray him? Here, take the sop and do what thou must. Why? There was no Judas. There's no thief on the cross. There's no adulteress. You have no one opposing you. Only in the false sense of self. Step out of it. Step out of your false sense of self and out of their false sense of self into the one invisible self, I Christ. Here I Christ, there I Christ. Who opposes you? They oppose only your false sense of you. And it is their false sense of them opposing the false sense of you. In other words, the arm of flesh. But is not one with God a majority? One with God means I, Christ, here and there, am one with the Father. And that is the meaning of not being tempted. Now rest in I, Christ, here and there, one with the Father. There is no opposition. I will not accept the temptation of opposition. I rest in universal identity as I Christ and that is the identity of those who appear to be my opposers that is the identity and the reality of these things which appear to be opposing conditions and don't stop at the talk stage or the thought stage that's just opening the door to resting in the knowledge that I Christ here and there and the only living identity. There is no second. I am all there is. There is not even a human here where I stand. Let alone there where they stand. All there is is the living spirit of God. Now rest in the word. And abide with patience. No matter what the outer circumstances continue to be. You will discover opposing persons and opposing circumstances even if they appear to be successful are still a successful lie. They never exist. And even their apparent success will ultimately turn to your ultimate triumph. It must because I, Christ, has already overcome the world. I, Christ, has nothing to overcome. And the moment you have something to overcome, you have lost your priceless heritage as the child of God. You've got to climb your mountaintop all over again. Get thee behind me, Satan, is what you say to your opposing conditions, your opposing persons, and you say that in your mind to your thought to the thought in you which says you have opposition to that thought you say oh no I recognize you you are the tempter you are the liar you are the antichrist you have no existence 
and I need not accept and dare not accept that which you are presenting to me as my own thought. You have overcome your own thought. And you'll find that all your opponents and all the opposing conditions existed right here in your thought and nowhere else. Closer than your thought, closer than your hands and feet, closer than your breathing is, I cry. You see how you come right back to the Father's house where you stand? Ultimately never to venture out again. Now what power have we used? None. What have we defended against? Nothing. We have rested in truth. I am that self which is the self of the Father everywhere, and beside that self there is no other. The secret of no power is one universal I, Christ. And the secret of problems is the belief that beside one universal I, Christ, there is another or many others. Now that's not complicated. There's not much to remember. It's not a lot of words. It's not a lot of truth. It's a way you live. And as you develop the habit of living that way, you'll find the secret of no power is your own identity realized as the invisible identity of the universe. Christ is not the only child of God. As long as you've got mortality to deal with, you have not translated the appearance of mortal forms into the one invisible Christ life. Remember, the invisible there is the invisible Christ life everywhere, appearing to human sense as many forms. Life is there as invisible Christ, Forms are there as the mental tempter. The herd of cattle isn't there. The covey of ducks isn't there. The wedge of birds in the sky isn't there. The litter of kittens isn't there. Why? because this is a spiritual universe. All that is present is the invisible light of God. All that is present is the light of your being everywhere. There is no mortality. There is no animality. There is no nature. There is the light of God everywhere, interpreted by the tempter into the many forms we see. When you have overcome the belief in the forms by knowing the life that is present behind them, you'll find even the tempter becomes a friendly tempter. Nothing to fight, nothing to argue about. Just pat him on the back and say, on your way, little man. I see all of this and I'm even going to enjoy it but I'm going to live in that fourth dimensional consciousness of the invisible light of the Father, I, Christ, my identity everywhere, whether it's seemingly friend or foe, and I'm going to rest in the knowledge that no power is needed in I, Christ, realized. 
nothing to overcome. You might stumble across some scenes where you see a couple of animals setting upon another animal and you wonder, what can I do about it? How can I protect that animal? Well, that's how I Christ. Rest in the knowledge of I Christ is there, not three animals fighting. And watch. Watch how truth in consciousness shows you that what you were seeing isn't what's there. And that truth in consciousness dissolves what seemed to be there, and lo and behold, there's three very harmless animals no longer at war with each other. When you are resting in the one invisible life where the three forms seem to be. You'll find many opportunities to practice this. Life is full of all these unexpected moments when they're thrust upon you. And if you've been living consciously in your identity, it won't catch you by surprise. You won't have to change gears suddenly. You'll be in the right spiritual gear to just look and say, yes, I see it, but... I am not tempted to accept that there is discord here where I stand in the kingdom of God. Certainly, there's no one who's going to live this way unless they have been subject to many, many bad conditions in this world. You won't find people jumping into this who have a yacht that can take them around the world and every foreign country they want to go, who is free as the breeze right now and sailing high. They're not going to be interested. But if you've had your yacht and it capsized one day, if you've had your big business and it turned upside down, if you've had your health and it went away, if something happened in your family that really made you sit up and wonder what it's all about, then, and only then, are these stringent steps something you can look at and say, it's not too hard for me. No, I'd rather travel that hard route than the knocks and bruises of a, a world where freedom is a myth. I can only live in spiritual freedom. That's the only kind of freedom there is. When you reach the plateau of knowing that only spiritual freedom is truly freedom, then no matter how difficult the course, what of it? It doesn't stop at any particular point. It's not going to stop in 20 years. It's a continuation of self throughout eternity. Every ounce of truth in spiritual consciousness that you develop now is yours throughout eternity. We're not looking at the next 15 or 20 years. We're looking at a life without beginning and end. We've graduated to the place where life is our concern, not form. Where when we hear the word Christ, we know we're talking about life. As contrasted to the human idea of life called form. The garment of immortality is in life, not in form. I think we reached a place where a pause would be good. We'll just briefly rest in the word. I, one with the Father, 
There is no division between your identity and God. No division in space, no division in time. Always, wherever you happen to be, even in a sense of form, your true identity is one with God, inseparable. And therefore, in an instant of recognition of that identity, the fullness of God can flow through your identity, expressing divinity, omnipotence, omniscience, perfection in all things as living grace. Whenever you rest in the knowledge of I, Christ, I, my grace, is thy sufficiency in all things. <coughs> and so we abide there. In that consciousness which is not subject to the temptation to believe in a world or conditions that were not created by God. take a little recess for about six, seven minutes. You can always depend on Joel for a surprise. And so when he takes the ground out from under us, we know that he's getting warm now. He's given us an introduction. Now he's ready to <coughs> talk to the faithful. Now listen to this very subtle phrase here. We rest in the word that the carnal mind is not enmity against God, it is the arm of flesh, a nothingness which must be understood to be an impersonal source of evil. An impersonal source of evil. Somebody can be coming at you with a hammer and this is an impersonal source of evil. Now how can that be? A whole army can be coming to your nation and this is an impersonal source of evil. Whatever is he saying? Impersonal meaning without a person. These are his words. Impersonal meaning without a person person and then without a you or me we are the person it is without when we impersonalize it well it would take 10 years for us to really reach a place where we could say, oh, I see what he means. Now here's this army coming, and you're to impersonalize it. Here's this epidemic, and you're to impersonalize it. And the way you impersonalize it is, don't get rid of the human army, don't get rid of the human threat, get rid of you. 
Well, isn't that I, Christ? And the only identity here? They have only the arm of flesh. We have the Lord God Almighty. We have Christ's identity. Everything forces you to you, to stepping out of the false sense of you, to let I, Christ, do the work. And even though we can reach verbal and mental agreement about these things to some extent, nothing takes the place of a deep meditation in which you are able to release yourself from the false sense of you. Now, here's an exercise which I find is very effective. I call it stepping out of my environment. According to the human sense of things, you're standing right where you are, in a dress or a suit. It's Sunday at a certain time, at a certain address. None of that is true in I, Christ. And so the exercise is to step out of your environment in your consciousness. to know consciously that I am not a person moving within four walls under a roof on a floor I'm not living in a time or a space I'm not living in a mortal sense of self I'm breaking all of the bonds of the conditioned mind in this meditation Son of God has no place to lay his head. But that is me, the Son of God. I have no place to lay my head. I don't even have a head to lay. I am pure everywhere spirit. I have no human environment. This is in your meditation. And you're not concerned in this meditation about the logic or reason of it to a human mind or to any other human mind. You're breaking the fetters of a false sense of environment, resting in the knowledge that I am not a finite self. I'm breaking the fetters of time. I am that self which was not born of father or mother. I am that self which is not confined to a shape or a weight or a size. I am pure self. I have no human environment. I do not live in the world. You won't find myself walking on this earth or in the stars or in the atmosphere Myself is the only. There is no earth or stars or atmosphere. There is just my pure being everywhere. And in this meditation you rest there. You rest in the word. I, Christ, the unlimited self, the infinite self. Infinite as the Father, one with the Father, unbounded 
free. You're not trying to make it happen. You're realizing the nature of being. It's only a spiritual exercise. But when you lose the sense of mortality there and the new awareness tumbles in, you realize it's much more than a spiritual exercise. It brings in a whole new government. It releases you to the law of spirit. It releases you from the law of karma. It releases you from human thought, human predicaments, human situations, the need for human decisions. It moves you in the rhythm of grace. I find every time you enter the exercise of leaving your environment. You reach the place of realizing your immortal self. It's better than reading an entire book. It prepares you so that you don't even have to face the tempter. Your new consciousness knows no tempter. The tempter only exists in the old world consciousness. You are out of the way. And when you're out of the way, lo and behold, so is the tempter. The tempter is only where you are. To get Satan out of the way, get you out of the way, you'll find you and Satan disappear together. Here in the kingdom of God, there's no tempter. The tempter is only in the world, not in your father's kingdom. The tempter is never in your consciousness of Christ. But that tempter, that so-called evil, is a very disguised force that it forces us into the kingdom of God realized. The of the Holy Ghost happens when you have left your world environment in your country. For then you transcend time and space, which is the backdrop of the complete dream of mortality. When you're doing this, you're really saying, Speak, Father, thy son heareth. I'm not in the world where I couldn't hear you. I'm in your kingdom. Now I can hear every word. Reveal thyself, Father. I'm ready to serve thy word. Not my will, not my word, but thine. Remember this exercise. And it doesn't matter when you do it, you will find that when you come back into your so-called sense of mortality, the world around you won't be quite as ominous as it seemed to be a moment before. Nor will the material weight of the world seem quite as heavy. You will be a lighter individual. You'll begin to sense the realm of 
miracles where nothing is impossible where you expect the impossible always because the impossible merely is another way of experiencing that which is not of this world but is in my father's kingdom Out of your environment, in physicality, in the world around your physicality, you know the power of grace. It functions in the infinite sun, who is not earthbound, anchored to the material sense of life. And it flows with its hidden manner, its divine qualities. They appear as you. Thou seest you, thou seest the Father, when you have left the false sense of environment. That takes the false sense of heredity right with it. The world beholds where you stand the activity of God. It's a very pleasant spiritual exercise. It isn't done with any great mental power. It's just a resting in the knowledge that all that can be here is the kingdom of God. And all of the false props of the mind, time, space, motion, matter, structure, physicality, these never have existed in the spirit. For that 10 or 20 or 30 minutes, you will not have a digestive system to worry about, or a back, or an arm, or a shoulder, or a heart, or even a brain. You are being the perfect self. Incorporeal spirit. And it has a carryover effect so that the consciousness you attain in that moment of grace becomes part of the consciousness that walks with you during the rest of the day. You discover the ease and effortlessness of living. <coughs> I go before you. Throughout the chapter, Joel speaks of impersonalizing and nothingizing. When you have allowed yourself to accept I, Christ, and followed it to its logical conclusion, not being earth-bound in your consciousness, you have impersonalized the world. You have nothing eyes the conditions of the world. You are letting spirit transform your environment through that mind which no longer is the human mind. And so your world is renewed, regenerated. Power of spirit ever present as it is, now begins to direct your affairs. Infinite intelligence guides you in all things.
You are not a house of parts. You are not doing acts that are unordained. You are not mounted in self-will, self-love, self-esteem, self-aggrandizement. You are letting the Father build the house. and you will prosper because it is the law of the spirit that sufficiency must appear wherever the Son of God is and if that be you that sufficiency must appear in all things A little walk in the kingdom of God will always restore you to the faith that God is present. You will know you have never been apart, never in a limited corporeal self. that you have never really had a true problem you only had a an unconscious separation from that from which you can never really be separate and more and more you know child of God is truly your real name For you there is not a future, there is an infinite now beckoning saying live in this infinity of being now. Don't fractionalize. Don't let that little mind torment you into being a creature again. Don't get rid of the human problems, get rid of the sense of humanhood. Take the whole backdrop of humanhood away. Step out of your mental environment into the fullness of your being and rest, abiding, letting the word live itself. It's a grand and glorious experience and a preview of freedom. In your true self, you are now free. Back in the mentality of a human being, we are in an involuntary bondage to world thought. Living out a false sense of karma, which never exists in reality. Making corrections where there's nothing to correct. I, in the midst of you, have overcome the world. When you are I, you will discover there is no world to overcome. I am the unbounded self of the spiritual kingdom. And I am come. My kingdom has come. My kingdom is not from hence, but here, now. You are in my kingdom, for you are myself. <coughs> you will read from time to time that certain groups have suddenly found meditation. We read, for example, that the ACT Conservatory Theater here has just found meditation. They've had a 10-week program now, and, says the director, from a practical standpoint, we find that there's less friction, there's more confidence, everything works better. And he emphasizes, I'm only interested from a practical point of view. 
And then there are others who state that they were on narcotics. But this is a better trip because it's a continuous trip without the ups and downs. Now, when they find meditation, this is still the kindergarten stage. And it is usually to improve a sense of humanhood. And I want to be sure that we are not meditating from the standpoint of improving our sense of humanhood. We are meditating to leave our human environment, to leave the conditioned thought which has placed margins around us, and to break those margins, which are only mental margins, to come into the unlimited sense of spiritual selfhood with absolutely no desire or thought or hope of improving humanhood because that would be tragic. Our purpose is to be spiritual being which has overcome the world and to live in the freedom of pure spirit under the law of spirit guided by the love of spirit in a universal oneness free of world appearances doing, living, experiencing the greater works which are the inherent heritage of the Christ So we come to a place now where to do the greater works you must express the greater sense of self. The lesser sense of self will only do the lesser works. Where will you stop? The moment you find a place to stop, you have lost infinity. The law of infinity is to continue in my word. Continue in selfhood. Continue until the infinity of your being is so clear to you that every finite thought and action no longer interests you whatsoever. You won't pour yourself back into a straitjacket called mortality. The infinity of spirit is our home. And we're learning to be comfortable in it. Even though we travel for a while without eyes. The spirit of the Father will lead us it will be our hands. It will be a lamp unto our feet. It will be the very activity of our being. And though we seem to walk without the usual crutches called senses, we are developing senses of the soul to walk in the invisible kingdom. Satan won't try to keep you out of that kingdom once you have discovered the human mind is that Satan. Otherwise, Satan works under the cloak of your own human mind and naturally you believe that human mind until you know that it is the devil of the Bible. Then you can rise above it, free of it. You'll even find that it turns right around to help you once it is subservient to your higher self. Remember our exercise, stepping out of your environment 
it's worth much more than a long, long sermon. I hear a little rustling. I suppose it's time. Is that it? Well, I guess it is. We're staying with Satan for a while. He has a few things for us and we for him. I think we're going to lick him. I think we have some wonderful surprises for Satan. And uh, I want to say hello and uh, a welcome to all the newcomers I've noticed. When I say newcomers, I mean just to this room, but you're not new to spirit and I know it. And so we're all old hands now at walking this invisible path through. Thanks for being here and next week we're going to continue with this very chapter and we're still in the last part of 8 in John. I'm sure we'll get to 8 in John next time. Thanks again. I hope you enjoy this spiritual audio. Like, share and subscribe for more.